We are in the Islamic month of Rabi'ul Awwal. And the khutbahs that have passed and the khutbahs that remain in this month tend to focus around the theme of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Because in this month the Prophet ﷺ was born, in this month the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Medina Munawwara, and it was this very same month in which the Prophet ﷺ passed away. And beyond these three major incidents, there are many other incidents that occurred during the Prophet's life in this month. So it becomes a great reminder for us, an opportunity to open up a book of Sirah, open up a book of the Prophet ﷺ's life and start reading. Because as Muslims, it becomes our responsibility, it is our responsibility to learn and know about the Prophet ﷺ. For those of us who may have read a book on the Prophet ﷺ's Sirah 10 years ago or taken a class 15 years ago, there is a obligation, there is an obligation on our shoulder that we keep renewing that knowledge. We read it again and again and again. And trust me, Sira, the Prophet's biography, is one of those subjects that if you read it a thousand times, you'll never get tired of it. The greatest experts in the world, the scholars that I've met who've dedicated their lives studying, researching, and teaching Sira, the Prophet's biography, the one thing they all say is that every time I read it, I find something new. I learn a new aspect of a companion's life. I learn how two new narrations connect to one another. I understand the significance of so-and-so tribe at this part of the Prophet ﷺ's biography. There's always something new. So why do we learn? Why do we study the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ? Out of the many reasons, the three most important ones, first and foremost, so we can learn to love the Prophet ﷺ. We learn the Sira, we read his life, and that way we learn um, about the Prophet ﷺ and also learn to love the Prophet. ﷺ. So it's two things learning about the Prophet ﷺ, and the second thing, learning to love the Prophet. ﷺ. But the third one, and this is where I wanted to focus today, is studying the Prophet's life so you can learn to bridge his example to yours. 
studying the Prophet's life and learning that there were many scenarios and many moments in the life of the Prophet that easily relate to our context. They easily relate to our times. And no matter whatever the whatever comes at you in life, no matter if it comes from the right, left, up or down, there will always be some way for you to go back to the life of the Prophet or the great companions of the Prophet and find an example there. Let's start with something simple. So we know the Prophet ﷺ in his life, from a thematic point, had great days, meaning happy and joyful days. And then there were those days in the life of the Prophet ﷺ that brought sorrow and grief to him. So the Prophet ﷺ experienced these two emotions quite regularly actually. And when he experienced them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the opportunity to experience these emotions, not just on a minimal level, but on, in great amounts. So there were moments in the Prophet's life where the Prophet was so happy, he was so joyful. For example, on the conquest of Makkah Mukarramah. The Sahaba they say the Prophet was so humbled and so honored that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a chance to come back to Makkah Mukarramah now as a conqueror, that he took his hand that he was holding the rope for his animal with and he put his head against it. And he said to the companions, I'm humbling myself in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when he comes into Makkah Mukarramah, he praises two rakah. And that's how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would thank Allah. You can just imagine the joy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the day he married his first wife Khadija radiallahu anha. And the day he held, he held his first child. And the day he's getting his daughter married off. And the day he's carrying his grandson in his arms and he's, selling to, he's saying to his companions that these two sons are the leaders. These two sons are my sons. You know, there are so many great days in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam life. But at the same time, there were also tough days in the Prophet's life. There were those days that came that were really hard on the Prophet ﷺ. Some of these days were so hard for the Prophet ﷺ to deal with that he couldn't find the solution himself. The Prophet ﷺ was lost. And he turned to other companions and asked them, what do we do right now? You guys are probably wondering where this comes from. I'll tell you where it comes from. There are so many examples, but I'll give you one, I'll give you two examples. The first one is the incident of Hudaybiyah. The Prophet ﷺ sees a dream that I'm doing Umrah. It's been six years since he's gone to Makkah Mukarramah. And the Sahaba haven't gone to Makkah Mukarramah for six years. Someone who's, who was born in a city, lived their entire life in a city, and not just any city, the city of Makkah, and there's a connection with the Kaaba there. You've been facing that direction for years now with every sajda of yours. And now you have a desire and a longing to go back. The Prophet ﷺ sees a dream that he's going back. Ask someone who lost their parent. And then ask them how it feels the night when you see your parent in your dream. They'll tell you how excited you feel because something that you're, that's ripped away from your heart, you have a chance to be with it, even if it's for a few moments in a dream. But the Prophet's dreams were revelation. So he wakes up and tells the companions, I saw a dream, let's go for Umrah. The Sahaba, they rile up together, over a thousand of them start marching towards Makkah Mukarramah. And when they get very close to Makkah, the people of Makkah don't allow them to enter and they say, we will not let you perform Umrah at all. It's off the table. And they then signed a treaty with the Prophet ﷺ, and a part of the treaty was that you can't do Umrah this year, you can come back next year. You know how heartbroken the Sahaba were? They all thought that there was going to be a particular outcome of this situation. They all thought somehow or the other, some revelation would come or some angel would come or something would happen somehow and would turn this very tough situation into a positive one, but the outcome wouldn't be negative like this because they came with honor. These were adults, these were men, these were warriors. Each of these people came with their unique ability and they're saying, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you're gonna tell us that we have to go back home after we traveled all these days here without performing our Umrah? That's a disgraceful walk. And not only that, we lost our opportunity. We're so close, Makkah's there, you know. is right outside the, the hudud of the Haram. We're right there. We can go inside and perform the Umrah. And the Prophet ﷺ tells the companions, no. Take your ihram off, sacrifice your animals, we're going back home. When the Prophet said this to the companions, no one moved. Everyone sat. No one moved. Generally when the Prophet would tell the companions, this is what you need to do, everyone would jump to their feet and do what he told them to do. This is one of those scenarios that the Prophet told the companions, take your ihram off, we're going back to Medina, everyone sat there. The Prophet ﷺ had never experienced this before. He didn't know what to do. So he went inside the tent and his wife, Umm Salama radiallahu anha was there, and he said to Umm Salama that this is the first time that I've told them to do something and they didn't do it. And that's what happens sometimes when you face difficulty, when you have such high hopes, when you've already decided the outcome and it doesn't go your way. You're kind of in shock. 
You don't know what just happened. You feel like taking something and throwing it into your TV. You feel like taking your phone after you see so much pain on it and you throw it out the window because you don't want to see it anymore. You don't want to accept it anymore. And Umar Salama radiallahu anha says, O Messenger of Allah, they're not disregarding your command. They're just hoping, they're just waiting to see if maybe there's some other outcome. They're trying to see if you'll reconsider. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, there is no reconsidering, it's done. This is the command of Allah, the treaty has been signed, we're done here. So then she says, O Messenger of Allah, if this is your final decision, if you want them to follow you, what you need to do is go outside in front of them, cut your hair, sacrifice your animal. When they see you do it, they'll follow you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went outside and in front of them, he exited, he, exited the, he exited the state of Ihram. The Sahaba were in tears, they were crying. And they got up and they started cutting their hair and sacrificing the animals and started walking back to Medina Munawwara. Really put yourself in those shoes and feel the bitterness in their heart. Feel what they were going through, the anger, the rage. Some of them must have been thinking, why was this the outcome? I always wanted something else to be the result. And here I'm walking back home. What story are we going to tell people when we get back home? There was no Umrah because someone you know, muscle armed us out of Makkah Mukarramah. We, we couldn't break our way in. We couldn't sign our way in. We couldn't go into Makkah Mukarramah for our Umrah. And while they're walking back, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, he came to, sorry, Umar radiallahu anh, came to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, And he said to him, Abu Bakr, are we not on the right deen? Some que a question everyone's been asking with the recent news with regards to Aleppo. Aren't we on the right deen? Don't we believe in Allah? Is there any mistake we made? Isn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there? Isn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala observing us? Doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know what's happening here? Umar radiallahu anh, not these exact questions, but he's asking similar questions to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh. And Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh's response, I don't know how he gave it at that time. Because emotionally, if I was there, I don't know what I would say myself. But Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, he stood strong and said, with all of the arguments that you bring and all the questions you bring forward, I trust to, I prefer to trust Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I won't ever doubt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I won't ever doubt anything the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chooses, to, chooses. They walk on a little forward and an ayah of the Quran comes down. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just gave you victory. And everyone's thinking, which victory? You know, we don't see any victory. We're ashamed. But then they wait a little and they see in the near future, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens to them one of the joyful days of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's life. And Makkah Mukarramah opens up to the Muslims. Imagine the pain the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam feels. Because sometimes, I'll share one more incident with you. Sometimes you want something. And sometimes there's pain involved. Sometimes someone's life is there. Sometimes someone's losing their wealth. And you ask yourself, why? But always remember, أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِأَحْكَمِ الْحَاكِمِينَ Is there any doubt in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the grand judge? Is there any doubt in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom? You know, if there is a moment in your life that you need to be strong, if there is a moment in your life that you need to learn to trust Allah, it wasn't yesterday, it's not going to be one year from now, it's today, it's right now. Every moment of your life that you do ibadah, every sajda that you do, every ayah of the Qur'an you read, every time you will told in your life that you need to make your iman and yaqeen strong, and make your faith strong, and believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, all of that preparation boils down to these moments. The moments where your iman is shaking, and you're not sure how to make logical or intellectual sense out of what's happening in front of you. And people around you are whispering, and the atheists have come out of their closet, and they're all over social media saying, if a God existed, if a God existed, and shaitan use these moments to come to you when you're vulnerable and you're weak because you don't have an intellectual response. You can't answer why millions of people are displaced from their homes. You can't answer why there's a genocide happening in Burma. You can't answer why bombs are showering down on Yemen. These are things that you may not be able to answer. Or not just Yemen or Syria or Burma. Across the world, wherever pain, wherever people are, being, are facing trials, you don't have that answer. So what do you do then? You know, we'll talk about what you can do, but the first thing you need to do is know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of what's happening. And don't let someone come and tell you that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala existed. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without, without a shadow of doubt is aware of everything. And this isn't the first time this is happening. It's happened in the past and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always brought good out of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded those who went through difficulty, those who were martyred were granted the highest ranks in Jannah, and the generations after, they also saw the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that came on them. The Sahaba are great examples. 
Imagine what the Prophet ﷺ is going through. Try to feel the pain when he's walking outside Makkah Mukarramah and Abu Jahl and his, and, 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 and his crew are they're, they're beating and they're, and they're destroying the Sahaba, you know, the, the weak ones, and they're beating them. And there's Ammar radiallahu anhu there, Yasir radiallahu anhu there, and Sumayya radiallahu anha there. And they're just being beaten. They're being lashed and being beaten. And the Prophet ﷺ is helpless. He can't do anything. He's standing there watching. Sometimes you're looking at something on the screen and you don't know what you, what you can do. You want to do something, but you don't know what you can do. The other person's far away or the other person is beyond your reach or you don't have the political strength or you don't have the power to do something, the wealth to do something. You may not have the ability to do something and the Prophet is standing there and he's looking at this. He can't stop the pain coming onto this family. So what does the Prophet wasallam say? Sabran ya ala yasir fa inna ma'idakum al jannah. Just be patient. People may say that that's a cliche answer, but that's a prophetic answer. Be patient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely reward you. Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got you through your days of ease, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any doubt at all will get, get you through your difficult days. And I don't want you to build all of your momentum right now and empty the tank for tomorrow, because tomorrow something else may come. That's just the, that's just the, the cycle of life. These days come and go. Some days are good, some days are tough. And you just learn to cope with them, you learn to deal with it, and you take on what comes to you in your life. The Prophet Sallallahu and we turn to our own lives and we see, you know, look at uh, where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala blesses us with great days. And there is no doubt that we've all had great days. Then days come that we're tested by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So rather than viewing our tests and looking at our challenges in isolation, the wisest thing to do would be to build that bridge between the biography and the seed of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with our modern times. Bringing the bridge from the Quran to where we are today. Every time I read what's happening in Burma, every time I hear about what's happening in Burma, I open up Surah Al-Buruj. Because it reminds me of a group of people who were torched. They were literally lit on fire. And these people were being roasted. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recalls us of that incident. That their only guilt was, that they only, the only mistake they made was, they said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Wa ma naqamu minhum illa an yu'minu billahi al-aziz al-hameed. So, now I want to I touch on the second element of my discussion. So one is realizing what the problem is. And understanding there is a solution there. Now let's, let's walk a little in the direction of a solution. First things first, living oceans across from where tragedy is occurring, or sometimes living suburbs across from where difficulty and trial is experienced, you can get very comfortable in your little life. It's very easy for you to, become, for, to, 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 to lose your empathy, for you not to feel what other people go through. That's one of the benefits of sitting with fuqara. That's one of the benefits of sitting with people who have illness. That's one of the benefits of visiting the graveyard regularly. That you step out of your element, you step out of your comfort zone. Many of us don't ever want to do that. We don't feel comfortable visiting people who are not as lucky in life or may not have as much as wealth as we have. Or we don't want to sit with people who are sick because that's going to remind us of something that we don't want to think of. Or we don't want to sit in front of a person who's passed away. I know kids and I know families who've said that we refuse to wash our own father's body. Yes, I understand that for some of them it is an emotional trauma issue, but for others, the reason why they don't want to is because they've never had a relationship with death before in their life. They're too foreign to it. They're not accustomed to it. So we have to learn to step out of this. Many of us have this mindset that I don't care if the world burns down as long as I have my suburban home, as long as I have my nice car, as long as I have my salary, my college fund, as long as I can go to my parties on Saturday night and I can attend my weddings and wear my sharwani and get dressed up and take pictures and post them on Facebook, I don't care what happens to the rest of the world. The most I'll give you is a like or dislike or anger face on social media. Other than that, I don't care about other people. We've become those people. And this is actually a byproduct of the society we live in, where individualism is at its prime. Everyone is worried about their own. Everyone is worried about themselves. You won't find anyone who's willing to give another person a loan. Societies were built off of one another before. People contributed to society. So if you go to societies a thousand years ago, loan sharks did exist, but they weren't the most prominent way that people would borrow money from. In Muslim societies, people were weaved in with one another. 
So there was a trust factor there. There was a credit score that Islam taught us how to build by saying Alhamdulillah to every person that sneezed, by saying Wassalamu Alaikum to the person who, was, who, who said Salam to you, by visiting the sick person, Iyadatul Marid. These were all ways that you built your credit in society. So when you needed a loan, you would go to those people who saw you for the past 20, 30 years and they knew that giving you their money was not a lost cause, they were going to get their money back. But today we live in a community where there isn't a person who trusts the person next to them. A father doesn't trust his son, a brother doesn't trust his brother. Individualism at its prime. We've all just drifted away. People come to the masjid, we pray salah together five times a day, but look at the element of individualism, no person knows the other person's name. I would be surprised if everyone knew each other's names in a single center, in a single masjid. This is where we've reached today. And as a result of that, if we can't care for our neighbor, if we can't care for the people who we stand shoulder to shoulder with and pray with, how can we care about people who are far away? You know, everyone's worried about doing things that are far away, and I like that, I, I'm all for it. Where there's a crisis at hand, we run in that direction, we do everything we can. But first we have to deal with a personal internal crisis. If we can't fix this individualism in our own hearts, how are we gonna help people across oceans? How are we gonna help people far away? Learn to understand that this ummah isn't about you or you or me. This ummah is one ummah. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Al mu'minuna kalbunyan." Muslims are like one structure. Muslims are like one building. One part of it supports the other part of it. Now, two more points I want to make before we um, lead into salah. We're right there, actually. It's almost salah time, but quickly. People may ask, "What can I do?" This is a common question. I know what's happening, there's a lot of pain in the world, but how do I fix the situation? What can I contribute towards? So there's four points I want to mention. First thing, raise awareness. Every person has a different ability when it comes to raising awareness. And find your ability, find your element and raise awareness there. It's possible you may not be able to do something, but your voice may reach the ear of a person who actually can do something. The second thing, financially support. There isn't a single uh, um, aid institute in this country, right? that I don't know that, is help, that isn't helping countries right now where Muslims are suffering or humanity is suffering at large. You get to choose which one you want to go to. And if you're saying that I've already donated, well donate again, and donate again, and donate again. Put your money where your mouth is. The third thing, volunteer. Many of our institutions that are raising funds for people across the world, they need volunteers. They need people who are willing to go door to door and collect coats, collect shoes, collect books. So be, go to those institutes, any institute that you want. If you go to any institute right now in the United States of America who is who's involved in gathering aid and say to them that I have a few hours available, can I come and help you? They'll open the doors in a heartbeat and there'll be so much for you to do. And the last thing is build a bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make a lot of dua. Every difficulty the Prophet faced in his life, what you'll find in that story or before that hadith ends, he made a dua to Allah. He prayed two rakah right away. The Prophet built a bond. And if we don't find the importance in our dua, we won't be able to find the proper solution. If I may close off by saying, do something, but don't do nothing. Build, use this month of Rabiul Awal to educate yourself. Learn what the Prophet wasallam went through. Bridge that over into your life. Know that there's so much you can do. And the most important thing you can do is care for other people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusallun ala al-Nabi ya ayu wa al-Nadina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu tislima. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kullama dhakarahu al-dhakirun wa kullama aghafala an dhikrihi al-ghafirun. Qala al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arhamu ummati bi ummati Abu Bakr. وأشدهم في أمر الله عمر وأصلبهم حياء العثمان وأقضاهم علي رضوان الله تعالى عليه مجمعين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إمامنا رب العالمين اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما أعطيت وقنا واصرف عنا برحمتك شر ما قضيت فإنك تقضي ولا يقضى عليك إنه لا يذل من واليت ولا يعز من عاديت تبارك ربنا وتعاليت فلك الحمد على ما قضيت ولك الشكر على ما أنعمت به وأوليت اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك منه نبيك وحبيبك سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما استعاد منه نبيك وحبيبك سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم أنت المستعان وعليك البلاغ ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين برحمتك يا رحمة الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين